being involved in these wars of aggression. The first speaker is somebody that I am proud to introduce and humble to introduce at the same time. Joe Glenton opposed the war, refused to go to the war, went to prison because of the war and is here today to give you a message this war is wrong and it won't work. Joe Glenton. Thank you everyone. Um, I'm going to read out the statement which we're going to hand into Danny Street later on, which has been signed by uh, over 20 former servicemen, British and American, uh, in defiance oh, of the war. <laughs> All of them Afghan and Iraq vets. Uh, it's all crap on. Oh, yeah. We are making this statement in defiance of the propaganda and the lies of supporting the so-called War on Terror for the last 10 years. We believe that Siegfried Sassoon's words of a century ago apply to the wars being prosecuted today against innocent people. And he said, the war is being deliberately prolonged by those who have the power to end it. We are veterans from the British and American Armed Forces acting on behalf of servicemen and citizens at home. We know that these wars have nothing to do with democracy or security or women's rights or peace or stability. They are fought for money and power and nothing else. Our comrades' blood has lubricated the ambitions of the few. The goals could only have been achieved by negotiation and this remains the case. We have seen and endured the suffering of the soldiers affected by these wars and unlike those who sent them to fight, we know these people at a human level. We have seen and regret the suffering of the innocent people in the countries involved. We are protesting against the conduct of the war and the reasons it was started by the United States and the United Kingdom. We object to the insincerity and imperialistic objectives for which people continue to be sacrificed, displaced, tortured, imprisoned and wounded. On behalf of those suffering now, we make this protest against deception. It is our aim to destroy the myths and the ideas promoted at home that these wars are fought in the best interests of the people, or that they are in any way patriotic, meaningful or necessary in the interests of the great majority. Ten years is long enough for a war that has nothing at all to do with the terror, yet it is carried out under that premise. At Nuremberg it was decided that no soldier can hide behind the mythical, and I'll repeat that, mythical obligation to obedience at any cost. This applies precisely to the situation today. This should also apply to those who claim to represent us. I'd just like to make a mention, obviously there are other servicemen locked up now as I was, particularly obviously Bradley Manning uh, and Mike Lyons who's currently languishing in a, on a political sentence in a prison in Colchester and there'll be a vigil held for him, uh, well, on the day of his, uh, at the appeal court, I think it's on the 13th of next month. Um, and to finish, please join us when we go down to Downing Street. We can knock on Mr Cameron's door if he comes out this time. He doesn't tend to be in. Uh, and if he is, then beers are on him. Or tea or coffee or whatever. Thank you very much. Joe, thank you very much. Absolutely brilliant message and inspiration in your work and what you're doing. Thank you very, very much. Stop the War Coalition has enjoyed the support of a lot of writers, a lot of journalists and many people have given their time and energy to it. One who's written brilliantly for a different foreign policy, a different approach and for peace and for justice is our great friend who's going to come onto the stage and speak now, Seamus Mill. Welcome Seamus. Thanks Jeremy and thanks to all of you uh, for coming today to Trafalgar Square. Now, it's 10 years since the invasion of Afghanistan and the launch of the War on Terror, a, a war that has since spread to Iraq and Pakistan, from, Pakistan, from Palestine to Lebanon, Somalia to Yemen, and now in Libya today. It's a war with no end in sight. It's not a war on terror, but a war of terror. 
that has killed hundreds of thousands of people, made millions refugees, and spread terrorism, resistance, and savage repression. Now, 10 years ago, the anti-war movement warned that the invasion of Afghanistan and then Iraq would lead to disaster. It wouldn't deliver democracy, it wouldn't liberate women, it wouldn't defeat terrorism, and it wouldn't bring peace, but the very opposite. Ten years on, in one country after another, we have been proved right, and the politicians and propagandists blinded by imperial arrogance have been proven horrifically wrong. But still they don't give up. Once again today, the United States, Britain and NATO are in action in another Arab and Muslim country, and this time it's Libya. And this time they said it would all be different. There would be no boots on the ground. The Libyans would be in charge. The aim was protection of civilians. Tell that to the thousands of civilians who have been forced to flee, who have been wounded and have been killed by the bombardment of NATO and NATO-backed forces now in the Libyan town of Sirte. Tell that to the families of the estimated 20,000 dead who have been killed since NATO intervened and vetoed one ceasefire and set of negotiations after another. Tell that to the black workers who have been lynched by pro-NATO forces across Libya. And instead of Libyans being in control, NATO is now threatening to intervene if the wrong people end up in charge. Libya is not a humanitarian intervention, but an attempt to hijack the Arab revolution that can only lead to more conflict. Because of course, these wars are not about terrorism or dictatorship, but an attempt to force Western domination and control of resources across the Arab and Muslim world, and now to save NATO's face. The political class knows it's lost the battle for public opinion on Afghanistan and the war on terror. Especially now it's being paid for by cuts at home, which is why they're talking about an exit strategy in three years' time. But it's not happening on the ground, and it's not what they're actually planning in 2015. So our job is to turn public hostility to the war into unstoppable pressure to end it. Let the people of Afghanistan and the Arab and Muslim world decide their own future and bring the troops home. Thank you very much. Thanks, Seamus. Thanks for your writing and the brilliant message you gave today. I'd like you to give a very warm welcome to somebody who's been an amazing supporter for Stop the War Coalition. Amazing musician and promoter and presenter. Please give a very warm welcome to our great friend, Brian Eno. Thank you very much. Two minutes isn't a very long time. Um, probably today you're going to hear a lot about the cost of the war, which I think at the moment is running in three or four billion pounds, um, which is 12 million pounds a day in current spending on it. So I thought I'd like to take my two minutes to give you some examples of what else we could do with 12 million pounds a day. So I did some back of the envelope calculations. We could build three large schools a week. We could build a very major hospital in 20 days' work for it costs us to be in Afghanistan. We could uh, perhaps help the doctors and nurses and uh, teachers, 800,000 of them in the country, by giving them a pay rise of £1,000 a year. That, that would cost us about four months of what we're spending in Afghanistan. We could um, do something about childcare. England, which has the third largest defence budget in the world now, also has the highest cost of childcare in the whole of Europe. Seven times, for example, what it costs in Germany to bring up a child, because the government helps us so little with that. So for poor families, 23% of their income on average is spent on bringing up their children. Um, in Germany, it's 3%. 
to equalize us with Germany. Suppose the government decided to divert some of their Afghanistan money to bringing up, them, to helping us bring up our children. It would cost. <laughs> I'm nowhere near that. <laughs> it would cost us. Uh, what did I work out? It would cost us about uh, 80 days in, in Afghanistan. Culture, the Arts Council had a hundred million pounds cut last year. That's that's eight days in Afghanistan. The World Service had um, 46 million pounds. That's less than three days in Afghanistan. The World Service is probably the best ad for England in, in the rest of the world. And the war in Afghanistan is possibly the worst. So, when, okay, when you hear um, when you hear the government saying we've got to tighten our belt, there's one belt on one very big fat belly which is never being tightened. I think that's the one we should be looking at, defence spending.